In Afghanistan, a remarkable development has taken place, which may seem unlikely given the country's long history of war, violence and poverty over the past half century. Afghanistan is currently in the process of constructing a massive project known as the Koshtepa Canal, which is said to become one of the world's longest and largest irrigation canals once completed. What makes this project even more remarkable is that it has been undertaken without any foreign aid or external engineering guidance. The Koshtepa Canal is a man-made river stretching over 285 kilometers in length with a width of 152 meters and a depth of 8.5 meters. It runs through northern Afghanistan starting from the Amu Darya River in the Balkh province and passing through the provinces of Jawan and Farab. This ambitious project aims to address the pressing issue of water and food shortages that Afghanistan is currently facing. As a response to the growing crisis, construction of the canal is progressing at a relatively fast pace, with approximately half of the canal already completed and the remaining sections under construction. This initiative demonstrates Afghanistan's determination to achieve a significant milestone despite the challenging circumstances it has faced. Some nations that share the Amu Darya River with Afghanistan have raised concerns about the potential impact of the Koshtepa Canal on their allocation of river water. However, Afghanistan has firmly pledged not to permit any such adverse effects. It has also emphasized that it's the only country in the region that has not benefited from the river's resources, and therefore it is entitled to its fair share. The urgency of the canal project is particularly evident in northern Afghanistan, which has transformed into a barren land over the past few decades due to factors such as global warming, dwindling groundwater reserves and a lack of adequate irrigation systems. The canal project aims to address these pressing issues and is expected to provide water to more than 1 million Afghans. Additionally, it will enable thousands of farmers to re-establish agriculture in the region. This transformation will involve converting 55,000 hectares of land into farmland, with a strong emphasis on growing grains and wheat. In fact, Afghanistan has set the ambitious goal of becoming a wheat exporter by the year 2028. The Koshtepa Canal project commenced in March 2022 and is planned to be executed in three phases. The first and second phases involve the excavation of the canal itself, while the third phase focuses on the installation of water irrigation systems and other necessary infrastructure. The project is under the management of the Afghan National Development Corporation and is entirely funded by the government, with the initial estimated cost standing at $500 million. However, recent assessments have indicated the necessity for an additional $100 million, prompting questions about how the Afghan authorities managed to embark on such an enormous project with limited and somewhat outdated equipment, a scarce number of seasoned engineers and no external assistance. Some Asian media outlets have been highly critical when describing the construction of the Koshtepa Canal, alleging errors, carelessness and subpar engineering methods. Nevertheless, upon thorough investigation, it is clear that this media outlet's criticisms are unfounded. The government provided the project's funding and devised its blueprint based on extensive land surveys and soil studies. They did not approach this complex endeavor haphazardly by merely sending excavators to commence work. One of the primary objectives of these comprehensive studies was to ensure that water lifts would not be necessary, as they would incur additional costs. Furthermore, the studies aimed at flood prevention during the winter season and ensuring the compatibility of the soil. Consequently, the canal had to be strategically rooted across level terrain, maintaining an elevation similar to that of the source area at the Amu Darya River. Another crucial consideration was the selection of the most fertile lands and their proximity to towns and villages along the canal's path. Once the canal's route was established, 200 private contractors were distributed across 114 sections, representing the initial phase that spans 108 kilometers. This workforce included approximately 7,000 haul truck and excavator operators, in addition to project engineers. They tirelessly worked on the project and continue to do so as they have now transitioned to the second phase, which covers a length of 177 kilometers. Every contractor followed a specific procedure in their work. They arranged multiple excavators in a row, leaving sufficient space between them to accommodate the whole trucks. These trucks were then loaded with material and departed systematically to deposit their loads in designated low-line areas nearby. Once a section had been excavated and received approval from the engineers and supervisors, the machinery would transition to the next section and replicate the process meticulously, adhering to detailed maps and specifications. 
The project's initial phase involved the construction of 14 hydraulic gates, each surmounted by a bridge for vehicles. These gates were strategically erected to address flood prevention needs during the winter and periods of heavy rainfall, when the water levels in the Amudaria River surged. To maintain control during the filling process and prevent soil displacement at the canal's banks, dirt walls several meters wide separated the 114 sections. Consequently, the sections were filled at a deliberate pace. The process began with section number one, which is closest to the Amudaria River. Once this section was completed, water was allowed to flow into it. Subsequently, other sections were gradually filled as the dirt walls between them were removed. It's important to note that the Kosh Tepa Canal's floor and sides were not lined with concrete slabs. The decision regarding whether this was advantageous or detrimental depends on one's perspective. However, from our standpoint and considering the consistent water levels of the Amudaria River, which have not diminished due to the initial phase of the canal's filling, the absence of concrete slabs translates to more natural irrigation potential extending up to a kilometer away from the canal's edges. Additionally, it contributes to higher groundwater reservoir levels, serving as backup water sources in the event of severe droughts. Financial constraints also played a significant role in the decision, as the installation of concrete slabs would have incurred an additional cost exceeding $1 billion, which Afghanistan cannot afford. In terms of infrastructure, two concrete bridges were constructed, one for the Heron Bulk Highway and another for the railway. In keeping with the programmatic approach, the Afghans opted for a straightforward, solid reinforced concrete slab design involving in-situ casting rather than prefabricated components. Furthermore, a comprehensive network of irrigation pipelines was seamlessly integrated into the completed Phase 1 and its surrounding area. These underground irrigation pipelines were strategically designed to provide farmers situated up to a few kilometers away from the canal with access to water. Additional water mains were installed to connect with water pumps in nearby villages and towns. During the final stages of constructing Phase 1, an astonishing amount of up to 1 million cubic meters of soil was removed daily. A remarkable feat, particularly considering that many of the excavators and haul trucks used were old and in some cases dating back to the 1960s. As part of their environmental efforts, thousands of trees were also planted along the canal banks to fortify the soil and prevent erosion. Furthermore, a 20-kilometer area was cultivated with various crops to enhance the agricultural landscape. To assess the soil quality and the efficiency of the irrigation systems, the local residents near the canal have witnessed and continue to experience a significant economic upturn. This has been driven by the employment of thousands of workers, the revival of old farms and improvements to the road infrastructure. Contrary to some negative reports, it is worth highlighting that all the contractors, as well as their prospective workers, have consistently received fair and timely compensation. Another noteworthy aspect observed during our analysis of the project is the diversity within the workforce and the remarkable level of optimism and contentment among the workers, farmers and inhabitants in the neighboring regions. These communities have endured a bleak environment for many years, characterized by wars, droughts, water scarcity and widespread poverty. Furthermore, an extraordinary development linked to this project is the widespread adoption of solar panels to power homes and workshops in the nearby areas. These areas, largely disconnected from the broader power infrastructure, are now witnessing the emergence of small solar panel installations, even on the newly established farms, to support water pumps. Originally slated for completion in 2028, the project is progressing at such a rapid pace that it may well be ready as early as 2025. Additionally, further construction efforts are underway, including the development of more bridges and culverts. Lastly, it is crucial to highlight that Afghanistan, along with a substantial portion of its 40 million inhabitants, predominantly residing in rural and remote areas, is grappling with the specter of famine. This dire situation has been exacerbated by the country's severe economic sanctions. In light of these challenges, we earnestly hope that more large-scale projects focusing on water management, agriculture, electricity generation and infrastructure development will follow in the footsteps of this remarkable initiative. These endeavors hold the promise of aiding Afghanistan in recovering from the scars of prolonged conflict and moving towards becoming a productive member of the global community. As for the question of whether Afghanistan, now under the rule of the Taliban, can successfully complete this colossal project and embark on new ones, we invite your thoughts and opinions in the comment section. 
Additionally, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing to Megalux and hitting the notification bell icon for more updates.